President Abraham Lincoln was a great man. That goes without saying. All of his life, there were mysterious forces guiding him down a pathway to his destiny. Several who knew him personally wondered how he managed to rise as far as he did. Every step along the way, he met disaster after terrible disaster. A sickness that took the only true love of his life. A mother whose haunting memory stayed with him until the day he died. And a nation torn by civil war. Fighting deep episodes of manic depression, he managed to change the man he was into the man we know him as today. His life was filled with misery. Tonight, we will cover only a few of those documented in my case files. Hello, I am author and paranormal investigator Donald Allen Kirch, and this is Stranger Than Fiction. Forget the world you know. Enter a bizarre dimension where the strange and unusual guide your imagination towards the unimaginable. Life is stranger than fiction in these true stories, where the ordinary is replaced with the extraordinary. Explore strange legends, weird myths, and odd folklore. The facts are laid before you to examine. You're invited to draw your own conclusions on these true stories of the paranormal. For the life of him, the man could not understand why he had the need to be at the train station at such an ungodly hour. His trip had been a pleasant one, and he was traveling with a fellow companion, and all was well at home. Why was he in such a damn hurry? The only thing he could put his finger on was the fact that he was compelled to be there. Times were tough. They always were during a war. Well into its fourth year, the United States was again at war with her enemies. Rationing by the government had made things difficult for most, but Edwin had his admirers. Rich foods and things left to more affluent people came into his hands quite easily. He was an actor, and in troubled times such as these, actors were treasured commodities as well. Many a lady gave him all they could, hoping for just a brief interlude. Edwin, of course, politely exchanged embraces, but never did he take it into his nature to bribe or falsify. He was a man of honor. New Jersey weather was quite intolerable for Edwin, and his knee was bothering him yet again. The man had injured himself many years ago while performing Julius Caesar in a rundown Manhattan theater, and whenever the weather felt bad, so did he. He took the discomfort in stride. It helped him predict when and when not to accompany himself with an umbrella. Have the tickets, my friend. Edwin turned to see his friend John. John was on holiday, and both were heading back to Washington for further business. John happened to own a quaint little theater Edwin was interested in, and there had been discussions about scheduling future shows and times. Why, yes, sir. Just bought them presently. You are the man of the hour, sir. Edwin stated, taking his ticket. Both men did what was natural in a station. They waited. Something made Edwin look towards the train. The actor noticed a group of people gathering around a well-dressed gentleman who had decided to pass his time reading the local paper. He was also smoking an expensive cigar. Edwin envied the man. He could use a good calming smoke himself. Noise could be heard gathering at the front of the station. War protesters 
were doing their best to create a destructive and unpatriotic mood for all. Having the freedom to express one's dislikes of certain situations was so damn inconvenient at times. John, do you know that man? Edwin inquired, pointing towards the well-dressed gentleman. John squinted and studied his subject. Hmm, looks familiar. Is that all? Looks familiar? Edwin gawked, staring back at John in disbelief. Edwin, everyone looks like everyone else in Washington. Sorry. The eagerly awaiting signal was soon given for their train to start its departure. Both Edwin and John picked up their luggage. It was good to be moving once again. From the corner of his eye, Edwin saw people pushing the well-dressed man dangerously towards his train. The man himself was too occupied with reading his paper to know what was going on about him. There was a subtle matter of concern. John, hold my bags for a moment. John was left confused. A group of angry passengers had been busy with a local conductor purchasing their sleep cars as the train started to give out her signals for boarding. The actor covered his ears, never having been a fan for the escaping noise of steam. The well-dressed gentleman seemed to be nowhere in sight. What the devil? Where is he? People rushed to and fro, causing Edwin to rise and lower himself, hoping to dodge all and trying to find his target. Then he spotted a trail of cigar smoke. It was dangerously close to the train tracks. Someone, please, help me! Two pair of ghastly white hands held tightly to the railings of a nearby rail car. Edwin followed them down, noticing that the well-dressed man was hanging on for dear life. With all the activity and noise going on around him, Edwin surmised that the man had been accidentally pushed overboard, hanging on by sheer will. Edwin bounced into action. John, call the chief conductor. John, having no idea what was going on, stood motionless, looking silly, holding six carry-on bags. Quick, man, give me your hand. Edwin placed himself between both train and dock. One swift move from either could have ended his life. Desperately, holding on to Edwin's arms, the well-dressed gentleman pulled with all his might. Edwin winced. The man was heavy. The train started to move. Dear God, man, pull! As both men fell backward onto the boarding stage of the train, the train's sleeping car banged up against the concrete and wooden platform. At the very least, the well-dressed man would have been injured severely at the most. Well, Edwin didn't care to think about that. Well now, dear sir, are you quite all right? Oh, dear me, are you not Edwin Booth, the actor? Why, yes. The happy gentleman eagerly accepted Edwin's hand. Dear sir, I know your work. Indeed. Indeed, yes, I'm quite the fan. I thank you for your kind assistance, sir. I found myself the victim of my own clumsiness, ending up in a rather bad pickle if I do say so myself. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Edwin bowed with humility. It was a practice act, one every actor learned early in their career. May I inquire, sir, as to your name? You look rather familiar to me, and I am just curious. Of course. I am Robert Todd Lincoln. Lincoln, did you say? Surely not the son of our noble president. The same, sir. I'm heading down to the executive mansion just now. To meet with my parents. Edwin was at a loss for words. Both men eagerly exchanged their grateful fellowships, not realizing the fates that did lay ahead for them. On April 14, 1865, on Good Friday, Edwin's younger brother, John Wilkes Booth, would commit the first presidential assassination upon Robert Todd Lincoln's father, Abraham Lincoln. Also, the incident itself would take place in John's theater. Edwin's traveling friend, John T. Ford, was the owner of Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. 
Coincidences are strange and uncomfortable things. They cause us to look back on the actions we have taken in our lives and ask the question, is there more to what we are doing than can be explained? Robert Lincoln rarely spoke of the Booth incident. He did, however, write several letters on the subject, and he held no hard feelings toward Edwin. Edwin Booth's career was almost destroyed when his brother killed the president. Unlike John Wilkes Booth, Edwin had been a unionist and considered Abraham Lincoln the last best hope for the nation. The only thing that kept the man from insanity and ruin was in the knowing that he had saved Lincoln's son from what could have been a painful and terrible death. After years of shame and self-seclusion, Edwin returned to the stage. To this day, he holds the theatrical record for the most performances as Hamlet in America. Fear haunted Edwin, thinking the public would hate him for what his brother had done. But his demons were exercised when appearing upon the stage after three years of absence to roaring applause. It was said that men and women reacted so positively towards his return to the stage that for a full 20 minutes, production of the play had to stop due to the whoops and cries thundering in the theater. Every so often, Edwin would be coasted into telling his Lincoln story, but he never thought it appropriate to put it down in writing. He was just too ashamed of what his brother had done. So one has to ask the question, what was it that made Edwin go to the train station on that day at that particular time? The Lincoln family was surrounded by the occult. Abraham Lincoln's wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, was a believer in the occult arts. She had become interested in contacting spirits in the early 1840s when spiritualism became such a widespread fad. Mediums were known to travel through Illinois just to approach her house. She was an easy target. Lincoln, never fully believing himself, did allow his wife her indulgences. By the time the Lincolns made it to Washington in 1861, all in the government was involved with the spirit world. It was a fashionable thing to have a Ouija board and a medium at every state party. Mary Lincoln was known to host seances with most of the proud Washingtonians. There was at least one recorded account of President Lincoln participating in a seance. Mary Todd Lincoln, until the day of her passing, also claimed to have seen several ghosts while living in the White House. She saw the spirits of Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. One story had her chasing after one of her sons to scold him and ran face to face into the spirit of President John Tyler. It upset her so much she wouldn't come out of her room for three days. In February of 1862, Willie, one of the Lincoln's sons, died while they were in the White House. This sad episode naturally crushed Mary. Consumed with her loss, the First Lady became obsessed with communicating to the dead. Mediums were on a constant guest list when it came to the personal affairs of the Lincoln household. Many times, Abraham Lincoln had to bite his tongue and fester his own doubts about the mediums as they came to humor his wife. In the White House, most communicating with the spirit world would take place within the Red Room. Visitors today have claimed to hear mumblings going on just when the tourist traffic is low and the lights are being turned down. Could it be that in their deaths, the Lincolns are trying still to communicate with their beloved son? Lincoln himself was plagued with nightmares and he held them in great stock. He would often discuss his dreams with both friends and family. Several days before he was assassinated, some had stated that he predicted his own death by sharing with them a dream he had.
In this dream, Lincoln had been awakened from his sleep to the sounds of a woman weeping. So concerned was he that he put on his clothes, prepared himself, and went out of his bedroom to investigate. No one was in the White House in this dream. He was totally alone. Upon entering the East Room, he discovered a coffin on display with guardsmen around it. They were stationed in honor around the oblong box, and several mourners were all downcast. The sight horrified the president. He turned to one of the soldiers in the room and demanded to know who was dead in the White House. The soldier, who turned to the president, stated, It's the president, sir. He was killed by an assassin. Lincoln's death shattered an already fragile nation, just recovering from a horrible civil war. His memory is not only honored by Americans, but the world over as a great leader. Lincoln's life was a fantastic tragedy of sorrow and bitter accomplishments. He was the only president to face a free election during his nation's civil unrest and had won. He freed countless millions from a life of bondage and helped to rebuild a people with foresight and forgiveness. Sometimes the fates love to test such a soul. Thankfully, Abraham Lincoln passed the test. Compare and contrasting, let's take Abraham Lincoln's terrible destiny into a modern content. There are a great number of similarities in the assassinations between him and President Kennedy. I will list only a few. Lincoln was elected on November 6, 1860. Kennedy was elected on November 8, 1960. Both had previously been members of Congress. Lincoln was first elected to Congress in 1846. Kennedy in 1946. After their assassinations, both men were succeeded by Southerners named Johnson, and both Johnsons were born 100 years apart. Andrew Johnson in 1808, Lyndon Johnson in 1908. Both men were killed on a Friday by shots to the head as their wives sat next to them. John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln in a theater and fled to a barn. Lee Harvey Oswald, Kennedy's accused killer, shot from a school book warehouse and fled to a movie theater. Both assassins were killed before they could be brought to trial. Lincoln was shot within Ford's theater. Kennedy was killed in a Lincoln limousine made by the Ford Motor Company. Last but not least, Kennedy was warned days in advance by his office secretary about danger in Texas. Her name was Evelyn Lincoln. There are also many of ghost stories about the Lincolns coming from the walls of the White House. Lincoln's ghost has been spotted roaming the halls of the executive mansion. Once, the Queen of the Netherlands was awakened one dark night during the Roosevelt administration and came face to face with the 16th president. She would often comment about his cold and piercing gray eyes. One last note. Prime Minister Winston Churchill, upon one of his many stays in the White House during the Second World War, loved to take late night baths and smoke a cigar with some aged brandy to help him relax. One cold night, after leaving his bath, Churchill walked around his room with nothing else on but his cigar. So, naked as the day he was born smoking a cigar, Winston Churchill stated for the record that he encountered the ghost of Abraham Lincoln tending to his fire. The man was horrified, but he was also Winston Churchill. Never one to panic, the greatest politician of his time, stark naked, simply took his cigar out of his mouth and said, Good evening, Mr. President. You uh, seem to have me at a disadvantage, sir. Churchill later stated, after his remark, 
that President Lincoln calmly looked up at him, smiled as if chuckling, and simply faded away. The last reported sighting of Lincoln's ghost came just before President Truman had the White House gutted and remodeled. Although the work revived most of the house to its original splendor, Lincoln himself seems not to approve. During troubled times, Lincoln liked to read classic Shakespeare. Several times in the Lincoln bedroom, there are people that walk by and just out of the corner of their eye see a dark figure sitting at a chair as if reading from a book. Could it be that during our nation's troubled times, the 16th president still believes that it's his duty to try to calm himself by reading a little Shakespeare? If you would like to see my work, go to my website at donaldallenkirch.com. That's Donald Allen, A-L-L-E-N, Kirch, K-I-R-C-H, dot com. One word, donaldallenkirch.com. My books are available in both ebook and print format and can be found on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. It would be an honor to entertain you. So, for Stranger Than Fiction, this is Donald Allen Kirch wishing you unpleasant dreams. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But... In a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Good night.